I'd say right now I'm focused on myself. <laughs> I'm focused on raising my own frequency, taking care of my own self, and following the synchronicities or the breadcrumbs that, that have been left for me by my higher self. I'm not searching for anything. I'm not trying to teach anything. I'm not trying to heal anybody else. I'm focused on raising my own frequency because by me raising my frequency, I indirectly and directly am helping the collective raise their frequency, but it starts with myself. We must have a high tolerance for chaos. Learn to embrace the flow. Forgive all that we can't forget. Regret nothing we can't let go. For despite what we have learned, infinitely more we do not know. So let us tune our frequencies until new vibrations grow. Let's pretend that it never ends. And now, it's time to start the show. Since we first recorded the first podcast. I did not know that. April something 2016. In our living room in Bloomfield. Living room in Bloomfield. <laughs> and then uh, the first episode didn't come out till like a year later on April 20th. That's how long it took me to do the first episode. April 20th? April 20th. And the last episode I did was in October when we went down to Violin and I interviewed Vince from the Genesis show. And that was number 43, and I wanted you to be number 44, and now it's April, <laughs> and the last time I did one was October. But so this is not 44 then? This is, no, this, no, it is 44. Oh. This is 44. I mean, granted, a lot has happened and a lot's been going on, but yeah, the idea originally was to have you, you were episode 11, you were mm -hmm. episode 22, then it kind of got screwed up with you and mom over Christmas, so she was like 33 and you were 34, I'm probably going to go back and retcon that, and now here we are, episode 44. Interesting, after the 4-4 portal just happened. Explain the 4-4 portal. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just know it's a sacred gateway for uh, awakening. I mean, it's just an, a day. I don't know the details. I just know it's a highly energetic day in which some sort of gateway is opened so that we could, you know, wake up a little bit more, do some, I don't know, a lot of people did some meditations, a lot of people did yoga workshops, so on and so forth to uh, unlock other Potential the realities, I guess. But that wasn't on the full moon. No, the full moon was a couple of days ago. Right. The eighth. And today's. Which the... I did nothing for. No, me neither. I mean, except for my meditation yeah. when the moon was out. What? Uh, what's the day today? The eleventh. You should know. You've been talking about Holy Saturday. It is. It's Holy Saturday. April eleventh. You know, it, it does sort of fascinate me, Jesus crucifixion story and holy week and how little you you know considering how much you've sort of studied jesus and done all these readings from the essenes and and all over the place yeah but all of the studies that i do on jesus have nothing to do with the catholic view on jesus or what happened to him but isn't there an, an overlap i mean he was crucified right do they talk yeah, about but that? that's not his main i mean that is his main teaching i guess if you really want to look at it like that but 
I researched the stuff before that. Okay. His childhood, his upbringing, his yogic studies. Tell me and about I it. study mostly the channelings that this woman from today does. So that's just the teachings that Jesus would want you to know in this day and age. Nice. So it doesn't really go over the history. I take what I read about his history with a grain of salt. I find it fascinating, the book about Dolores Cannon and the Essenes, that he was raised in that community. But again, I don't know what really happened. So you're mostly listening to, who's the woman that's channeling him? Gina Lake. Gina Lake. Recently, or has she been doing this? She's been doing this for years, I think. I just recently discovered her. She's not the only person to channel Jesus. I'm assuming not. I wonder if different people that are channeling Jesus, if their information is the same or if it conflicts. I will be playing devil's advocate for most of this. (laughs) I think when it comes to channelers channeling the same energy or entity, I think that a lot of the time the it doesn't necessarily the information doesn't necessarily conflict with each other. It's just well, I guess it's if it's different, it's conflicting information, but. I think it depends on the person receiving it because they can only receive a certain frequency of information compared to the next person. So Gina Lake is receiving one frequency of his teachings and the other person or people channeling him is receiving a different frequency of his teachings. Whatever they're ready to hear, whatever that channeler needs to hear and whoever her audience is, is they're going to get a certain type of information and then Gina Lake and her audience are going to get another type of information. Hmm. I think it has to do with the conduit and the people that they're reaching. Okay. Where are you at right now? Your spirituality, what's going on in the world with the coronavirus? Um, you do, you've recently become very, very enamored with Elizabeth April. What are you focused on right now? I'd say right now I'm focused on myself. <laughs> I'm focused on raising my own frequency, taking care of my own self, and following the synchronicities or the breadcrumbs that that have been left for me by my higher self. I'm not searching for anything. I'm not trying to teach anything. I'm not trying to heal anybody else. I'm worried about And not worried, that's the wrong term. I'm focused on raising my own frequency because by me raising my frequency, I indirectly and directly am helping the collective raise their frequency. But it starts with myself. I'm practicing discernment. I'm trying to really, when I'm faced with some situation, whether it's in our relationship, if it's with Devin, if it's what's going on in the world, before I'm reacting to it, I'm trying to really go inside and see what it makes me feel like first before I address it if that makes sense it makes to me it makes sense what do you think based on your studies what what is happening now um, with the virus because of the virus uh, what, what's going on on the planet I think and fully believe that every single thing that happens is happening just as it should Mm -hmm. whether you want to call that uh you know a soul contract uh whatever it is or divine timing or um you know everything's meant to happen you know whatever however whatever term you want to use i i believe that everything that's happening on the planet right now is for our highest and greatest good and that this virus is waking us up on multiple whether it's you know uh waking up uh, the the people who are so addicted to their work and the nine to five um if it's waking them up to the idea that you know actually family and self-care is more important Mm -hmm. than your job and your career and making money whether it's waking the masses up to the idea that as a, a world we have to change our financial system, our education system, our healthcare system. <laughs> all I of mean, our systems. Right, all of our <laughs> systems. Whether, you know, it's, it's, it's multiple levels of awakening. And again, it's very 
it depends on where people are at within their own growth you know like I said it could be the lawyer who has a family um, but you suspend 14 hours a day at, at work and only two hours with their family mm -hmm. and now they're being forced to be with their family mm -hmm. every single day and and kind of reawaken to why they had a family to begin with for some it's on, on that level and that's helping them wake up to something for some of us it's a global it's on a global level where we we believe that you know this is going to co collapse our all of our systems and and help and force us to change the things that we all know need to change on a larger scale as a whole world you know changing the love frequency on the planet or whatever it is do you i mean i feel that this is only the beginning Absolutely. But this is nothing compared to how bad it is or how bad it could get in order to to uh, accelerate that shift. Do you feel that, I mean, because you, you know, we've all heard all the conspiracy theories about the coronavirus. Do you, do you think that there is a nefarious agenda around this? Now I see you contemplating. So while you're while you're contemplating, we talked yesterday about how there could be a nefarious agenda, but that simultaneously it is working for the greater good. So so like they're like hey 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 we're gonna release this virus, mm -hmm. but what they don't understand is it's gonna cause it's gonna help accelerate the spiritual and weekend. and because you know it can like. You're saying it could be nefarious, but it's in their soul contract to do so. So really, they are doing something good for the planet because through their evil, they're helping the masses awaken. Sure, um, I, I don't know. Um, you know, it's hard to say because there's so many sources that say, you know, it it just was a mut mutation from. Bats, bats or... you know, whatever. Some people in the spiritual world are saying that China had created this and released it, you know, at the perfect time. And, and then they were, in between those two, there's just so there's... many theories. So it's hard to say what I believe. I mean, I does it matter? Does it matter? No, of course it doesn't matter no. where it comes from. Right. I mean, really, for some people it matters because some people need to be sure that there is a conspiracy out there, mm -hmm. um, or and some people need to be sure that that it's it's just a natural thing. And, and for them, again, it's, it's all subjective, right? But in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter. It's, it's happening, it's here, and it's changing things, whether we like it or not. And that's where I'm at with it. Do I think it was a created virus? I do think that. My intuition tells me that. Okay. Um, not necessarily something that I've heard from anybody else, but I, I do feel that, that this was created, um, and it's, it's doing what the, those who created it wanted it to do. What do they want it to do? I don't, I mean, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> how, I'm not going to pretend that I have any idea what I'm talking about right now. How have you been, <laughs> have you been, how have you been uh, dealing with the, <clears throat> the home quarantine thing? Like what, what things have been difficult for you and what, in what ways have you changed or been motivated by this? You were going to be at home anyway. Right. And for us, <clears throat> just in full disclosure, our son, Vero, who I'm burping, which is why you hear the pumping in the background, he was born on March 2nd, 2020, like, like two weeks before everybody went on lockdown. So there's that. Right. So we were going to be home together anyway. You know, I find it funny that I was defending myself and setting up so many boundaries about no visitors for 40 days, and then, like, now nobody has a choice. Yeah, not to explain that. Explain the no visitors for 40 days thing. Where, so where it's this, this is a, a thing that comes from many different cultures. Um where it's only the immediate family with the baby for the first 40 days. Some lineages or some cultures do it for the first 52 days, some do it for the first three months, and it's really just because this is a brand new baby, uh, you know, and it's, it's a way for the, fam the immediate family 
just to bond with the baby and not overstimulate the baby with other people, other energies, other opinions. And for me, it was really because it was the opinions and the, the overstimulation for him. Like, why should we expect a brand new baby to be born, a traumatic birth, no matter how you look at it? You know, whether it's a C-section or a vaginal birth or whatever, it's traumatic for the baby coming out because he's been in the womb for nine months and now all of a sudden he's spit out into this world, all these lights, all these people, all these energies. It would be overstimulating for anyone. So for me, I really wanted him to just have us around to show him that all of his basic needs were going to be met, to show him that he's safe, to get to know us, to be within our auras only, and not be stimulated or affected by anybody else's energetic frequency but ours as a family. That was very important to me. That's well Passing said. him around to five different people, this person saying, why isn't he circumcised? Why did it? I don't want to deal with any of that shit. Again, we're right. not talking about our son's genitals with anybody but ourselves and the people who are listening. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm which saying? Is, but which like, is barely anybody. Right. So... What, what, uh, the decision to do circumcision, to not do circumcision. Well, let's list our reasons for that. I mean, what's the purpose of doing circumcision? Like, that's really where I'm at. Like, why? <laughs> okay, why? Right. What? Why would you put a brand new baby under a traumatic, painful experience? I've read articles from doctors who've performed this surgery on newborn babies that said... I will never perform another circumcision on a baby because something like they it's it's more traumatic than I, I don't even remember the, the quotes that I've read from these doctors, but doctors mm. are saying that the, the babies go into so at first they start crying because it's painful and then they stop because they're they're in such shock their nervous system is in such shock from the pain that they can't even get a cry out mm -hmm. like are you fucking kidding me? Why would you put a baby through that just because you want his penis to look quote unquote normal? That's just the most ridiculous thing ever. And I don't even don't even bring up the topic of the biblical reasons for it because then I'll just fucking lose my oh, mind. Oh yeah, no, I'm not I'm not getting into or the that. religious reasons, whatever. I guess I might be more concerned about this than you. Not that I I'm terribly concerned, but when he gets older and he starts having sexual experiences or he starts you know playing sports in the locker room with other guys. Um, that could be an issue. It I don't think it's going to be an issue because I think more parents nowadays than not are not circumcising their sons. Interesting. So I think by the time he reaches that age, you're going to see more uncircumcised penises mm. than than you have in the past. Okay. <clears throat> oh, by the way, speaking of which, uh, you said whether the baby's born C-section or vaginal is still traumatic, but I would just like to point out, you delivered vaginally, which was which was an accomplishment because Devin was C-section your first experience, and that was 10 years ago, mm. and uh, you were able to deliver uh, vaginally. Mm -hmm. Not exactly the way we wanted, because there was no tub. Right. Um, why don't you just briefly talk about that experience, <laughs> that experience of... The whole thing? The yeah, birth, the day, yeah. yeah. So, it was the day before my due date. March 1st, around 11 o'clock. No, I, I would say around 9. When we were getting ready to go to bed, I started feeling contractions, but mm. they were very mild. But they were painful enough for where I couldn't get comfortable to lay down to go to sleep. And so I think I just got up and started walking around the house. And around 11.15 was when, p.m., was when I started actually saying, okay, these are actual contractions. Like, this is really happening. You and Devin slept... Um, and I was up all night having contractions. Um, and the reason I wanted you guys to sleep while I was having contractions was there was really nothing either of you were going to be able to do for me. And, mm -hmm. you know, I really needed you. I wanted you to have a good night's sleep. So when I'm in labor, you could be aware and awake for me when I needed you to be. Like, if you were up all night with me, that was just been silly, in my opinion. And then sure. be up all day the next day. Like, it was just... Sure. So... You know, the contractions were getting worse and worse throughout the night, and I really think I waited as long as I possibly could before going to the hospital. Mm -hmm. By the time it was 5 or 5.30 in the morning the next morning on March 2nd, 
they were getting to the point where they were almost unbearable. Right. Um, and I was like, you got to call my dad, like get Devin over there. We got to go to the hospital. They were mm. probably like three minutes apart at that time. No, they were like five minutes apart because mm. I called the midwife and I told her they were like five minutes apart. Um, right. So grandpa comes, gets Devin. We get into the car and go to the hospital. They checked me on admit. They checked my cervix and I was three centimeters dilated, which I thought was an accomplishment. Mm. Um, or not an accomplishment, but I, I thought it was like good progress. Right. Um, you know, we, we watched all these natural birth courses and I was very adamant about no epidural. Um, uh, I wanted to go in the tub. I definitely didn't want to be induced for any reason. Um, I thought and, that didn't happen. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, my my mentality, even through watching all this natural birth stuff, was like, I need to go with the flow. I can't be too attached to having it go any certain way because then I'm going to, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to make an appropriate decision if I was too stuck on one thing and one thing only or it going one certain way. Like, that's, that's never a good idea for any situation, I don't think. Um... So we get to the hospital, um, our doula comes, and I mean at that point my contractions were like so painful. And then you proceeded to go through the next, I mean at least what, five, six hours? I think it was like seven hours. I was going to say seven yeah. too because we got there like 7.30 and they didn't, uh, Yeah. I mean the, the spoiler is that we eventually decided to get the epidural. Yeah. <laughs> which I won't go into that that experience because I, I got pissed off that they were pushing for it because well I mean we were all these videos were like they're gonna push it they're gonna push it try and delay it try and delay it don't give in and that was exactly what happened but you didn't really communicate just how painful it was but it was not easy for me to communicate yeah. like I couldn't talk like right. I, it was no way for me to you know, the thing that I, I, I mean, I guess I could have communicated it, but I felt weak and scared to have said, I think I want an epidural. Like, I, I didn't, I, it, so after, there were certain contractions that had me in tears, you know, afterwards. I know, I remember. And, oh boy, boy, oh boy. And then after all those hours of going through the contractions, you were only up to six centimeters. Then we have to get to ten. Right. I mean, that was when I was like, oh, shit. Like, that was it? Well, you know, it came, the, the whole epidural thing came down to, like, I was not just in pain. I was now suffering. Okay. Like, I felt like I was being tortured. Like, I felt like somebody was tearing me from the inside out like it was it was the most painful thing I've ever experienced in my life and when I was thinking about how much further I had to go like I haven't even gotten to transition yet I wasn't fully dilated right. yet like if it's just gonna get worse how could I physically handle that you know what I mean mm -hmm. there was I didn't think it was possible to handle any more pain right and you know it, being in that much pain my mind being on the pain, it, it wasn't easy for me to just say, I want the epidural. Like, I physically couldn't talk. You know what I mean? Like, right. it was really hard to communicate that. Okay. So, I think having the midwife come in and suggest it was, uh, for me, a good thing. Because she was able to get me to say, yeah, right. I think I want this, you know? Okay. Well, I mean, obviously you needed it. I mean, it was obviously the right it, thing in the long run. It was the right thing. It was a way more enjoyable experience once I had the epidural. Right. It was, I could have a conversation with you guys. I could laugh again. Like. That's true. And then what? I mean, they gave that at around two. It was like three. Three o'clock. And you still went another six hours. Because he was born in 923. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know? So, all well, by told... The to yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. I mean, so, all told, it was about almost 24 hours. It was like 20 full hours mm -hmm. from the time you started your contractions the night before. <clears throat> but you did it. 
Mm. You pushed him out. And I watched that head go out. And then you would relax, and he'd suck back in, and out, and in, and then, then the head came out, <laughs> and before anybody knew it, before they could tell you to do the next push, you pushed on your own, and boom, out he came. Beautiful, crazy. beautiful baby. How, how has this experience been <laughs> uh, with him here? In the last month, I mean, for me, I feel like it's been difficult. It's been stressful. I mean, yeah, I think it's been stressful, but I, you know, no offense, have significantly more patience than you. <laughs> um, and I think I just understand him on a level where it's like when he when he cries, he needs something. He's not being a brat. He's not oh, being annoying, sure. you know. He, right, right. He, and, and a lot of times when he's crying, it's simply because he wants to be held and comforted. And yeah. he needs his basic need of love met. And mm -hmm. I, I as, as frustrating as it can be sometimes, I don't take, like, I don't, it's not personal towards him. You know what sure, I mean? It's just sure. a frustrating situation. Sure. Um, but I'm just trying to remain as, as patient and compassionate with him as possible because that's what he's getting from me as his mother. Yeah. Right now he's learning my mom is patient. Mm -hmm. I mean, on, a, on some level. Obviously he doesn't con con can't conceptualize it right now. Mm -hmm. You know, but, you know, I want him to learn from me that I can be tolerant and I can be patient and I can be compassionate. Right. You know, and, and I want him to know that from me, He's getting his basic needs met without me getting pissed off that I have to meet them. Well, it's funny you say that because I found that, I mean, the first two weeks were definitely rough for me. Like, definitely the first two weeks. But I have found that the more I've come around to being patient and compassionate with him and realizing that if he's crying, like, there is something that he needs and being more intuitive about what it is now just because yeah. we've learned yeah. the cues that he responds to me more because of that. Absolutely. Whereas in the beginning he didn't, and I was paranoid of that because sure. I'm like, he's feeling my mm -hmm. anxiety. And who wants to feel who wants to feel that? I mean if I could feel your anxiety then he could definitely feel right, it. You know exactly. what I mean? It affects me on a visceral level. <laughs> you know, and like Well no offense, vice versa. <laughs> well and that's Yeah. That just shows how sensitive we are. Right. But yeah. But I think that you've done a lot better the past week, for sure. And it's funny because there are times where I'm like, oh, God, why is he crying still? I did everything. But then, like, I'll pick him up and I'll walk around and five minutes later he burps. Yeah. So, and then he's completely calm. Yeah, and it's like, oh. So I was, it was like, just shit, I just missed that, you yeah, know? It was but, just a gas bubble. But it's always something. He's never crying for no reason. Right. Never. Right. And, and once I really accepted that he's never crying for just the sake of crying... That made me, that shifted something for me where, I, it, you know, it, it, it like clicked for me. Like yeah. He's not just crying. Right, right. He needs right. something. Right. Or doesn't want something. Like sometimes he doesn't want to be with you anymore and he comes to me and he's fine. Exactly. Or sometimes he doesn't want to be with me anymore and he goes to you and he's fine for, for an hour or whatever. Yeah, yeah, you know? absolutely. I don't like our arrangement right now where, where I'm sleeping in the bed at night, you're in the nursery on the, uh, the, full the single mattress mm -hmm. um, because he just wakes up constantly right it's not fair that both of us have to be up in the middle of the night all night then right. both of us are going to be exhausted in the morning like and I just do better on that type of schedule that little sleep yeah. you know I just yeah. physically and mentally and emotionally do better yeah you know and and you know you keep saying well if you want to come back to the bed if you want to come back to the bed but he just burped did you yeah, get that? I know. Oh. Yeah, I um, but like when he wakes up multiple times or is squirmy in the middle of the night, I hear you get very frustrated. Why am I going to come to the bed and just deal with you being frustrated but, again? But I, well, to, well, just like to, <clears throat> to be fair, I only got frustrated when because I stay up late, so I'm going to bed like one thirty, two, or I'm trying to push it at twelve thirty, and it just seemed like. Every time that I laid down into bed to fall asleep, that's when he would wake up. Once you would feed him and get him back down, I never heard any other time after that. Once I fell asleep, it wasn't an issue. Like, I never heard a thing. I just, that's how deep of a sleeper I am. It was only that initial, 
Like, I'm so tired, now I'm ready to go to sleep, and boom, he's waking up. Mm. But we've, we've developed a good system where you definitely realize that you need to take a nap at some point during the day. And so you've been taking, what, maybe an hour, two hours, whatever, and that really seems to help. Yeah, yeah. Does. I feel fine right now. Yeah. I mean, right now. I can and, always and like, yeah, in of. the middle of the night when he's up, like, okay, it, it was harder a few weeks ago getting up in the middle of the night without napping. So I have to say to you for forcing me to nap because now when he's up in the middle of the night, I don't, I don't get like that panicked feeling like I have to go back to sleep right now, you know, or I'm not going to be able to function in the morning. Like I'm, yeah. I, I feel a little better in the middle of the night when he gets up. I'm more like, oh, hey, you know, let's get you a bottle. Let's change you if we need to or whatever. I'm not so like zombie like you yes. know i'm able to sometimes i i get up if he's up at three and i'm feeding him i'll just turn on the the netflix and watch the show you know and it's yeah. it's it's feeling more normal to be up at those hours mm -hmm. it really is yeah if that makes any sense it makes perfect sense to me because it feels normal to me to be up at those hours really no but does. i mean in increments all night oh yeah I mean, that's what i mean it's yeah. starting to feel more normal and you know I'm not saying that I'm used to doing that because it's been a very long time since I've worked overnights, but I'm very adaptable to change in schedule and stuff like that. So. Well, that's because of your <clears throat> previous uh, experience at, uh, at Westfield being overnight yeah. emergency. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, just knowing that it's all temporary, you know, he's not going to be doing this forever. Right. Like Brian said, he noticed that one thing gets better every month. And I've already noticed that. Yeah, I'm trying too. to get this piece of hair away from your mouth. Fussy. He is fussy, though. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> you well, know I it. told you, when, he was, when I was pregnant with him, I remember one of the first things me saying was, this kid is not going to want to be held down against his will. Like, not that we would do something like that, but I, you know what I'm saying. Like, he's not going to want to do what he doesn't want to do. See, and then my, my paranoid self goes to, is he going to be like my brother? <laughs> like, I can't help it. And yesterday, mm -hmm. I was... Uh, I was showing Devin something on Facebook and one of the memories was that picture of me and my brother when he was a baby and I said look at this picture of my brother doesn't that look like Vera she's mm. like oh my god yeah like he really he really does look like him not completely but yeah they definitely have a, a, a certain resemblance but he is so handsome he's oh really my cute god he's adorable <laughs> all right well I don't want to spend too long talking about it because there are people even if, not that anybody's even going to listen to this, but they're like, okay, I get it, you know, I've, 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 I've either had a baby or I'm done hearing about babies. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and you, are you full? What's the deal? Yeah. How long? Any idea? It should say it on there. I'm here? Right, one hour. Mm -hmm. There's a lot you're going to edit out, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but we covered a lot already. I mean, really, those are the things on my list. I don't know. I feel like compared to the other conversations we have had in the past, this one falls short. But, like, too, like, doing this, it's hard for me to, like, get in a flow when we do this type of thing, like a staged you know, we're going to record now. Like, it's really hard for me to get into the type of flow that I get into when we have our really great conversations. Well, and that's why it takes us so long to do this, because it's not only our lives and our schedules, um, but it is. It's getting into, it's being in the mood. In the, and like you said, our but conversation... But the flows happen naturally. That's what I mean. You can't just cl click on the mood. I mean, maybe some people can do that, but I just can't. Right. Because I'm constantly aware of that thing, you know, and I stumble on my words or I have long pauses because I'm trying to collect my thoughts because I know that there's right. devices recording it. So. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And so the only solution to that is for me to sneak record yeah. you, but that's just, I, if I could pull that off somehow, you know, yeah. but how do you do that? Right. <laughs> when the conversation starts and you're like, oh, I gotta hit record, then yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's over. What are some good shows you've been watching lately? Unorthodox. I mean, that's over though. What is Unorthodox about? A Hasidic Jew community in which a girl um, essentially uh, runs away from and goes to Berlin 
and finds a new life. And it goes into her life as a, a wife um, and a Jewish and a Hasidic Jew and the community. They, they have a certain name for the community in, in Williamsburg, New York. There's a certain name for that specific Right, because they were all from, they were Hungarian Jews. Yeah. They lost a lot yeah, of people yeah. in, in uh, World right. War II. Right, and it was fascinating to me, like, just their, their culture and their religion and what the extreme, the extremity of it is, is what gets me. Yeah, and that's all based off of true, a book. book. It's yeah. a true, it's a memoir, yeah. Um, we watched Afterlife, Ricky Gervais, oh, yeah. season two is coming up. That was I really I hope good. it's as funny as the beginning of season one. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, I'm also watching some dumb stuff on Netflix, like, you know, extreme homes and things like that. But that's just entertainment for, to keep my mind occupied or whatever in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. We watched Tiger King. What a great distraction from what's really happening in the world, huh? Boy, well timed, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the thing, is all this stuff, is like, what did I say yesterday? It's, it's so obviously disgustingly transparent mm -hmm. yeah for people like you and me who get what's going on it's obvious do you want to explain the i mean I, I say elizabeth april but really she's everything she has said mm. has been established by other teachers the, the thing that's interesting about her is she claims, I'm going to say claims, yeah, of course. that uh, she's done no external research whatsoever. In years. In years. And all the information she's getting is purely channeled information. From? The Galactic Federation. What is the Galactic Federation? It's a council of Pleiadian beings who are um, essentially in charge of the... Uh, Keeping the peace on Earth, essentially. Well, it's not just Pleiadian beings. I thought it was like beings from from all over. Um, like my this... understanding is that they're Pleiadians. Okay. So what? I don't know if I want to get deep into this now, or maybe we should pause and talk about it later. But I'm, I'm, you know, I want to talk about the, the, the three D. What that video we watched the other night, like the three D. The shift from 3D to 5D. Is that too too much to get into right now? I think so, because that's hard. I'm still figuring it out. Right. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I don't really want to pretend like I know what the hell I'm talking about. Sure. And it, again, it's hard for me to be in the flow with that type of conversation. It really is. So where do you, where, where, where do you see it happening in the next few months? Uh, I don't know. There's there's multiple potential realities at this point, you <laughs> yes. know? Yeah. I mean, uh, we could still be on quarantine. We could be off. I, I think that the quarantine is going to lift very soon, but I don't think this is the end. I think that we're going to see other things like this in this within the next few years. Natural disasters, crazy shit is going to be going down in the next few years, I think. Because there are changes occurring on this planet, like psychic, spiritual, physical, you know, all of that. Like the old par it's it seems obvious that the old paradigm is dying off, yeah. as, as, as we know yeah. is coming or, or has been coming. I mean, and that's like even reflecting in your school. Like how many times have I talked oh. to you about like... The paradigm of education shifting and you being a pioneer of that in some way. And now we're seeing it and why, how you're disillusioned by your own school, your school. Yeah, totally. Which I don't even know if I want to get no, into I all get that. It, no. Like, I mean, that's funny. You don't want to get into the thing that you've been focusing on yeah, and, right. and just the uh, the switch to online instruction. Because I think we're both still trying to unpack our separate, whatever we're dealing with, we're still trying to unpack. Yeah. So it's hard to have a real discussion about it. I guess. I mean, I'm dealing with the fact that when left to their own devices, so many students, students that would normally be, you know, that are high, some of them are high performing, but the way they cheat and lie and game the system mm -hmm. and what it's doing to the actual education, like there's not actual learning taking place. Right. And that that's just that's just been extremely frustrating for me as a teacher who recognizes that the system is broken, but just to see that to see the students like just not 
taking it seriously in any way, shape, or form. Trying to find every possible way to plagiarize or, or you know, it's, yep. it's, it's like, what are we doing here? And then to get no support from the administration because, oh, it's a tough time for everybody. Yeah, but they have devices. They're home. Right. And then, and then the lack of parental <clears throat> oversight. It's just like, it's just so frustrating that nobody seems to care about actual education when education is vital yeah, but to that's, the future. Well, we're talking about the collapse of the education system. Right. If yeah. you want it to collapse so that you can rebuild it, that's where we have to be. Well, that was as much of Nikki as I'm going to get out of her because uh, getting her to sit down while well, we were interrupted in that conversation um, and had to go take care of something else. And I said, well, let's come back so you can um, uh, finish this out and ask me some questions. And <laughs> it is now 12, 13 days later. So I give up. I'm just going to finish out the last bits of information that I kind of wanted to share about my son, Vero. The first one being that he did pee all over me when we, uh, th like right after he was born, when he was taken to the station for the um, cutting of the umbilical cord, which I did cut the umbilical cord, and uh, but he peed right on me. Which reminded me of my brother, who apparently peed on the nurse as soon as he was born. Um, and then uh, at the first doctor appointment, a week later, when we took Vero, as soon as I took his clothes off to change his diaper, he projectile pooped all over me and if you know anything about newborn babies it's not exactly poop it's called myconium and it's uh loose so uh i took it i took it well i mean how else are you gonna take it when your son shits on you i guess i should start with his actual name which is vero alas dare d'ambrose alas dare a-l-a-s-d-a-i-r Vero, of course, being of Latin origin, meaning true. And Alasdair comes from the Greek Alexander, but Alasdair is the Scottish Gaelic version of that. And the reason why we chose that is because uh, that's where Nikki's family on her mother's side comes from, Ireland. So we got the Latin... We got the Greek, got my Italian heritage, and we have her Gaelic heritage. And D'Ambrose, of course, means of the immortals. So, uh, Alasdair means uh, protector or defender of men. So his name means the true defender of the immortals. Vero Alasdair D'Ambrose. Okay, so where did I come up with Vero and Alasdair? And I say I because we were driving to Virginia on our summer vacation and decided to come up with names, and I suggested uh, the name Verissimus, which comes from Marcus Aurelius. And as some of you may know, I am named, my mother named me after Marcus Aurelius, even though it's Marcus Anthony. But I'm named after Marcus Aurelius, one of the five good emperors in Rome. And anyway, so here's a, a passage from the book, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. It says that Marcus was brought up by his mother and paternal grandfather, a highly distinguished senator who had served three times as consul. So Marcus's paternal grandfather was a close friend 
of the emperor, Hadrian, and was the brother-in-law of Hadrian's wife, the Empress Sabina, Marcus's great aunt. As a member of a wealthy patrician family with ties to the emperor, Marcus was naturally part of his grandfather's social circle, and though we're told he was loved by all, something about Marcus especially caught Emperor Hadrian's eye. The emperor heaped honors on him from an early age, enrolling him in the equestrian order when he was six years old, making him what's sometimes described as a Roman knight. When Marcus was eight, Hadrian appointed him to the College of the Salii, I might be pronouncing that wrong, or Leaping Priests, whose main duty involved performing elaborate ritual dances in honor of Mars, the god of war, while dressed in ancient armor and bearing ceremonial swords and shields. Here comes the part about the name. Hadrian nicknamed the boy Verissimus, meaning truest or most truthful, a play on his family name of Verus, which means true. It's as if he found Marcus, a mere child, to be the most plain-spoken individual at court. So, anyway, I suggested Verissimus and uh, the girls thought that that was a little too complex of a name, and so we settled on Vero, which is derived from Marcus Aurelius's original last name, Verus. And then for the Alasdair, well, my father's first name was Albert, and his father's first name was Albert, so I wanted to pay homage to them but I don't like the name Albert. And without looking it up, I kind of assumed that Alasdair was some form of Albert, B but it's not. But I like Alasdair, and I like what it means, and so we decided to go with that. So there's the Al in it, you know, you can call me Al. Okay, so the next thing I want to share with you is Vero's spiritual name. Uh, in the Kundalini Yoga tradition, as taught by Yogi Bhajan, but that's a whole other story that you can listen to in the outtake of this episode, which is Nikki and I talking about the scandal of Yogi Bhajan. Anyway, so yeah, what you do is you go to the uh, 3HO.org website and you put in your real name or the person's real name, and they send you back an email with the spiritual name. So, of course, we did one for Vero, which I'll just read the email. Your request for a spiritual name has been gratefully received. You have been blessed to live as Tehran Gyan Singh, the fearless lion who embodies the power of God's divine wisdom, which enables him to ferry others across the material ocean to the safe shores of celestial consciousness. Tehran is the swimmer or raft with the power to take one across the ocean of life. Gyan means wisdom. All males receive the name Singh, the lion of God who walks with grace and courage throughout his life. Yogi Bhajan taught that every man can attain this divine state and encouraged all to manifest it. Use the rich capacity of your name, Tehran Gyan Singh, to manifest your soul's gift of fearlessly exemplifying God's divine wisdom that has the potential to relieve ignorance and suffering on earth. Fill each breath with the inner sound current of your name to remain immersed in the power of this sacred blessing. The radiance that flows from your oneness with the profound knowledge of the divine allows you to ferry others across the world ocean of unconsciousness onto the safe shores of celestial awareness and joy. The power of your spiritual name is that the more you speak and hear it, the more it permeates your being, opening you to experience its nod, N-A-D-H, universal inner sound current. Consciously merge with the vibration of the nod to come into harmony with your highest destiny. As I sit here at 2.16 a.m. 
on my shift of baby watching duty, having spent the last hour and 16 minutes just trying to feed him and get him settled. So to bring this whole episode full circle, Nikki mentioned Elizabeth April. And Elizabeth April is a channeler who allegedly channels the Galactic Federation, which is made up of Pleiadians, but they congregate with beings and races from all across the universe. Elizabeth April, you can check her out on YouTube, but uh, Nikki purchased a online group session which took place the day after we first recorded the podcast. And she was allowed to ask two questions that would be directly answered by Elizabeth. And one of the questions she asked was about Vero, what his purpose here on Earth is, and any other information she could give. And some of the stuff is fascinating, that's why I want to share it. So... One of the first things she said is that his name is Vero for a reason. And Nikki did not tell her the meaning of the name or how we came to the decision. So this is something that Elizabeth April said right off the bat. His name is Vero for a reason. Just to remind you, Vero means true. He is incredibly sensitive. He's deep, internal and he'll be a good space holder for others. Nikki was told that he has been a teacher to her in many cosmic lifetimes. However, this is his first human incarnation, which is extremely rare. He is apparently a crystalline energy being. And this part sort of threw me for a loop. He has no chakra system. So anybody who's listening that's familiar with the concept of chakras, he has no chakra system. He filters energy very quickly, nearly instantly, and therefore he doesn't attach to emotions, but he does feel deeply. He's going to process things differently, and he's going to have to learn to practice social boundaries. Hmm. Well, I will leave you with that. Um, yes, this is a podcast. Yes, I have conversations with others, not just my significant others or family members. But this is also the Opus Marcus podcast. And so it is important to use this as a way to document and archive my legacy. And now that I have a son unexpectedly. This podcast, along with everything else sitting on various hard drives, will be my legacy to him. And so one day, hopefully, when he's all grown up, he'll be searching through these episodes and discover this one and hear me talking about him as I look over and see him finally gently sleeping on the moon pod. Thank you, whoever you are that has listened to this podcast, episode 44. I really don't know when the next one will be, but I did order a high-definition webcam. So I hope to start doing video podcasts, which during the time of this pandemic is like a drop in a bucket in an ocean out in space. But it's something I've wanted to do for a long time, so we'll give it a shot. should be fun. Thank you, and I'll see you on the next episode. important stuff. That's right.
So now let's let's cover the unimportant stuff. It's a microcosm of all of the pain of the United States. Ooh. You see, uh, get this move. We, we left out off a uh, thought, a specific thought thread, you know, you don't remember where we ended it up. I'm not sure I remember what I did yesterday. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> when you're in the moment, there's only this moment. I guess tune in next time when I have some interesting shit to talk about. Other than that, I love you. I love the world. Peace out. Sir, I, I avoid responsibility. That way nobody feels compelled to put me in a position of power. Be excited. You know, because now it's here. A shiny gift of a lesson that you have in front of you. And now you know you have to work through it. You really have to, well, if you want to and you're tired of it, you have to work through it. Why, why not? And give yourself, I would call it a dose of real reality. I mean, like where nothing makes sense but everything works. Let's be real. None of this is real. You, you I feel like I'm telling you this. What's your advice for people in life? My, my advice is to stay strong, be helpful, be smart, be brave, be powerful, be kind, and be loving to everyone, even your pets. Remember to live. People are like, oh, I would get. Wouldn't you get lonely when all your loved one dies? I'm like, no, you get new loved ones. You know, we really don't know what's 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 in store for us. We really don't know. Uh, well, would you want to know? Well, no. No. Let's say something bad happened to you. Move on. It already happened. Just move on to the better things in life. I this great bird of prey is to be feared and awed at the same time. I don't know where the fuck I'm going. I hope it's really not just us. <laughs> right? And everyone else is like, self create eternal hell, no! <laughs> every, every waking moment is a joyous experience of growth and opportunity. I find myself totally spiritual-centered and at peace with the balance between me and the rest of the universe. We can't believe we're good at what we do, because if we believe that, then we'll stop doing it. And more than that, we'll stop growing. One heck of time! <laughs> Amen to that, my brother. Marcus, own the day, own your life. It's such a game changer. After all that, they won the game. Almost done. <laughs> Did I say this already? He sounds like No Face from Spirited yeah. Away. I could watch that movie again. Get that burp out. <laughs> <laughs>